Hello and welcome to Abtop. Infidelity is a devastating occurrence that can impact anyone, regardless of their circumstances. It has the power to shatter multiple lives simultaneously. Over time, my wife harbored resentment towards me, eventually justifying her decision to betray our marriage, causing irreparable harm not only to herself but also to me. It seems that fate has intervened. Following a busy five days on the road, I found myself seated on my deck, enjoying a cup of robust coffee, reflecting on the newfound freedom of our twins. Miranda and I had embarked on the journey that signifies the transition to empty nesters, a phase shared by countless parents. However, in that moment, I felt a profound sense of contentment that I doubted any other parent could match. When Luke started his journey at the Georgia Institute of Technology, Atlanta was our initial destination. Having rented a car there, we no longer drove together. The next day, we took our daughter Kelly to Gainesville, where she was supposed to start her college life as an alligator, and we went a few miles further east to Daytona Beach to get a well-deserved rest. The next three days were filled with more intimacy in bed than we had ever experienced in our entire marriage. Miranda's desire seemed unquenchable. The fact that we became parents at the age of 18 meant that at 36, we were still in the prime of life and full of energy. I can honestly say that I have completely run out of all body fluids. As I sat reminiscing about pleasant memories, Miranda had gone to shower and freshen up. I was taken aback when I heard the blow dryer start, a sound typically associated with her preparations for work or going out. Then I heard the unfamiliar sound of her shoes clattering in the kitchen. Normally, she wore rubber-soled indoor shoes or went barefoot. Before I could dwell on this further, she called out to me, Alan, sweetie, could you come and sit with me for a moment? I need to talk to you. Quickly getting up from my chair and taking my empty mug, I replied, on my way, darling. As I entered the kitchen, I was surprised to find my wife seated at the table, dressed in a fresh blouse and clean jeans, looking as lovely as ever. She had poured me a fresh mug of coffee and placed it across from her. Confused about what was happening, I took the seat she indicated. What's going on, Mary? I asked, taking a sip of the fresh brew. I'm leaving you, Alan, she said calmly as she picked up a large manila envelope. These are the divorce papers for you to review and sign. As she spoke, I was overcome with shock, rendered speechless and numb. This announcement blindsided me completely. Despite my stunned silence, Mary continued, everything is detailed in the paperwork. I'm not seeking anything from you. Whatever belongings I've left in the house are yours to do with as you please. Our savings and accounts have been divided or settled, and I've cancelled all joint credit cards. I've informed necessary parties of my change of address. Any further communication can go through my solicitor. Additionally, I've obtained a restraining order. I don't want any further contact after I leave. I have a new phone number and email, and all previous accounts have been closed. Please refrain from involving the children or my parents. They're aware of the situation and won't assist you. I'm sure you'll ask, so I'll clarify. I've been with Dan for the past 13 years, and I intend to make him my husband. While I still care for you, Alan, my feelings for Dan are stronger. He's waited patiently and deserves my full commitment. That's why I'm ending things with you. Miranda concluded and headed towards the door, grabbing a small carry case she had placed there earlier. Without displaying any emotion, she stared directly into my eyes and uttered, Sandy Thompson. After that, she shut the door behind her. That marked the end of my interactions with Miranda for 16 months. My colleague Dan Roberts who I had regarded as a friend for the past 18 years was also my work dad. Miranda, known as Mary, and Dan's wife, Laura, bonded during their pregnancies. They were kindred spirits, both close in age, Laura at 22 and Mary at 18. Their daughter, Cassie, arrived the day after Laura gave birth to twins, which meant the two wives were in adjoining hospital beds. Their initial friendship blossomed into a deep connection, making them inseparable. Consequently, us husbands were brought together, and the two families became so close that on weekends we often found ourselves at each other's homes, which was convenient since we lived just two blocks apart. Before our unexpected event that resulted in the birth of twins, Mary and I were both on track for college. Mary had aspirations of studying business or business management, while I had a partial scholarship for baseball and was majoring in math, albeit without a clear direction. Everything changed when Mary informed me of her pregnancy, prompting me to set aside my ambitions and find employment. Both of our parents were incredibly supportive, swiftly organizing a wedding within two months. 
My parents, who had me later in life, showered me with love and encouragement, believing they would remain childless. Miri, on the other hand, had an older brother who was ten years her senior with whom she had little interaction. Tragically, he passed away in a car accident a year after leaving for college, prompting her parents to focus their attention on her much like mine had done for me. As a wedding gift, my parents handed over the deed to our family home as they planned to relocate further south in anticipation of retirement. I landed a job at a local insurance company in sales and immediately excelled at it. Although the salary was modest, the commission structure could nearly double my earnings. The downside was the long hours, typically 12-hour days and occasional weekends. Mary took on a part-time receptionist role while pursuing her degree predominantly online. Her parents played a crucial role in supporting us, especially after the birth of our twins, eagerly stepping in as childcare whenever needed. Three years later, I was honored as the Salesman of the Year for the North Carolina region. Our company, recently acquired by a national corporation, believed in recognizing achievements. Along with a $2,500 bonus, I received an all-expenses-paid trip to Washington, D.C., where our headquarters were located. The itinerary included a gala dinner to determine the overall salesman of the year, followed by two days of leisure. Mary and I eagerly anticipated this as our first solo getaway since the twins' birth. However, just before departure, Luke contracted whooping cough, followed by Kelly the next day. Despite the setback, Mary encouraged me to enjoy the trip as planned. Arriving about an hour before the gala was scheduled to begin, I had enough time to check in and inform them that I didn't have a plus one accompanying me. After getting ready, showered, shaved, and dressed in my rented tuxedo, I located my assigned seat at the table, only to discover that I was seated next to Sandy Thompson from our Little Rock office. While most attendees were in their late 30s or older, Sandy was just a year older than my 21, and this marked her first full year with the company. Before this event, I had only consumed a few beers in my life, but here there was an open bar offering free drinks. I indulged in a couple of glasses of wine during dinner. When the awards were announced, I was stunned to learn that I had one salesman of the year. I was presented with a trophy and a $10,000 check. Upon returning to the table, a bottle of champagne had been sent over courtesy of the bosses. Honestly, the rest of the night became a blur from that point onward until I woke up at 5 in the morning the following day lying next to a gloriously naked Sandy Thompson. I was terrified and quickly retreated to my room, packed my things, and hit the road home within 20 minutes. Mary was completely taken aback when I arrived home four and a half hours later. However, her demeanor quickly turned sour when, ten minutes later, I confessed to getting drunk and spending the night with another woman. She didn't inquire further except for the name of the other woman, then promptly announced she was going to stay with her parents for a few days. She packed a small bag and left me with the kids for three days. She avoided my calls and refused to see me. On Tuesday, after dropping the kids off at daycare, I returned home to find Mary there as if nothing had happened. Any attempt to discuss the matter was shut down with a warning that if I ever brought it up again, she would leave with the kids and never come back. That night, we went to bed, but there was no tenderness. It took many months for intimacy to return, but it eventually did. True to her request, we never spoke of the incident again. The next year, Mary completed her business degree and aimed to secure a job that utilized her education. Our friendship with Dan and Lisa had flourished to the extent that we spent every weekend together with them, unless work commitments interfered for either Dan or me. Despite this, the girls continued to meet up regularly, although it was a bit different now as they had relocated 15 miles away to be nearer to Dan's workplace. Interestingly, Mary's parents had also moved to the same area to accommodate their growing family. They took on the responsibility of looking after Cassie, granting Dan and Lisa some additional freedom. Meanwhile, Dan's company was experiencing rapid growth and required an office manager and personal assistant. Mary turned out to be the perfect fit for the role, impressing the managers during her interview and thoroughly enjoying her work. She flourished within the company and became an indispensable part of Dan's team, earning her the nickname Dan's work wife. This arrangement lasted for seven years until tragedy struck unexpectedly. Lisa passed away from a brain aneurysm. On the date of her death, she was actually visiting me, as was often the case when Dan and Mary had to travel. The loss was devastating for all of us, particularly for Dan, who found it difficult to cope alone, especially with the responsibility of caring for his 11-year-old daughter. The solution was for Mary to spend a few hours three days a week after work, ensuring everything was clean and organized and preparing meals that could be easily reheated. 
At least, that's what I was led to believe. Sixteen months later, as I stepped out of the garage carrying the final box to load into the van, I noticed her car pulling into the driveway. It had been the first time she returned since she had mentioned wanting a divorce, and she was certainly the last person I expected to see. As she emerged from her car, I greeted her. Miranda, aren't you violating the restraining order by being here? My tone remained flat and neutral. How have you been? She asked. I shrugged. Living the dream. Would you like a coffee? Without waiting for a response, I began walking back towards the house. That would be nice, she replied, following me inside. The house was nearly empty except for a few boxes on the dining room table. The major appliances and one of the bedroom sets were left for the new owners. The estate sale had been quite successful in the past few days. Whatever remained was destined for the landfill, and the son of a former Caligua had volunteered to take care of that for me. The day before, I handed over the keys, his wife and one of her friends had also offered to help with the cleaning. There was only one birthday card on the mantelpiece, a reminder of my recent 38th birthday celebrated a couple of days prior, courtesy of my office colleagues, who had also given me a good luck card. That I had packed in my luggage after 19 years with the company, leaving behind good friends, was inevitable. Although it was a decision that had to be made, as we sipped our coffee, we found ourselves seated in the same spots we had occupied 16 months earlier. So, what brings you here today? I inquired. The kids got their letters about your move. Why didn't you just call them? Sending them registered mail seemed unnecessary, my visitor remarked. I actually did. Well, not entirely accurate. I called Kelly because I can't reach Luke. Why can't you call Luke? I asked. I don't have his number, I sighed. The kids don't really stay in touch with me. I could tell she didn't quite believe me. Resigned to proving my point, I reached for my phone on the table in front of me, unlocked it, and dialed Kelly's number. It rang ten times on speaker before going to voicemail. Glancing at Mary, I asked, would you mind giving her a call? She might be busy, Mary replied, making an excuse as she reached for her phone and dialed on speaker as well. Kelly picked up on the second ring. Hi mom, how are you? Kelly greeted cheerfully. I'm fine, sweetie. What are you and Cassie up to? I inquired. Just chilling. We're planning to go to a party later, so we're conserving our energy, my daughter replied. Have you heard from your dad lately? Mary interjected, giving me a pointed look. Yeah, I spoke to him last night. He mentioned talking to you and catching up with both of us for about ten minutes. I think he was planning to see Lukey today, Kelly answered, oblivious to the underlying question. My stomach clenched as she casually referred to Dan as dad. Mary sensed my discomfort and the slight hurt it caused. I reclined in my chair and gazed at the ceiling. You mean Dan? Yeah, but he likes it when I call him dad anyway. He'll officially be dad in three weeks, my daughter chuckled. In three weeks, my ex-wife was set to remarry. Ironically, they had even invited me to the wedding, as if I'd actually attend. So, when was the last time you spoke to your biological father? Mary persisted. Oh, I don't know, maybe a few weeks ago, the laughter faded from her voice. I had opened my call log to Kelly, and Mary could see all my attempted calls. Neither of my children had reached out to me since Mary had left. Well, that's interesting because I'm sitting with him right now, and I saw him try to call you just before I did my daughter's rather astute response. Just a reminder, your only father is Dan, isn't it? We'll talk later, young lady, Miranda ended the call, clearly upset. Why don't you have Luke's number? Dan ensured he got a new phone number within hours of his old one being stolen, I shrugged. Don't be too hard on them. It's how they've been programmed, I gestured to my call log on my phone. I'm no longer relevant to them, and as you heard, I've been replaced since you left. I think I've spoken to them for a total of one hour. I haven't even been in the same area code as them since you left. I tried, believe me. I even got box seats for the Braves opening day game, but Luke said he was busy. Only later did I find out he and Dan, along with a couple of other guys, got last-minute tickets. But hey, if that's what they want to do, I'm not going to force them. We sat quietly, lost in our own thoughts for a moment, before Mary shifted the conversation. So. Are you moving closer to your parents? Not exactly. I'm going down to take care of mom. She requires full-time assistance now. 
Oh my goodness, what's going on with her? How is your dad handling it? You never mention anything, tears welled up in her eyes. She's in the late stages of Alzheimer's. It's really tough. Most of the time, she doesn't remember anything. And about dad, we laid him to rest just over three weeks ago. They said it was a heart attack, but I believe his heart just couldn't bear it, I replied. Oh no, my ex-wife sobbed. How do you know it was a broken heart? And why didn't you reach out to us? I did make a call, which happened to be the last time I talked to Kelly, the day after Thanksgiving. That's when I learned Luke had a new number. Kelly quickly brushed me off, saying she was busy and would call back, but she never did. I tried reaching out daily for a couple of weeks until I finally got the message. Ironically, although they had blocked me on Facebook, they hadn't blocked Dad. I'd later found out Kelly was busy because she was going to the Black Friday sales with you and Granny Roberts, I said, using air quotes. As for knowing that he died of a broken heart, it's straightforward. I hadn't told them about our divorce. I meant to do it earlier but couldn't. When you left, I visited them the following weekend to talk face to face about it. That's when I realized how bad mom's condition was. Dad had mentioned her forgetfulness, but from the last time I saw them, the Christmas before, to then, she had deteriorated significantly. You wouldn't have known because you hadn't been able to come with me for the three years prior when I took the kids, I added, unable to resist the dig, knowing the reason she was unavailable. So, I couldn't tell them then, and it only got harder anyway. At Thanksgiving, after we had eaten and settled mom down, dad confronted me as he hadn't heard from you or the kids for over a year. So I told him the truth. The next morning, I found him in his favorite chair holding a picture of the four of us, still wet from his tears. Yes, our divorce broke his heart. You know, mom and dad had been married for 52 years. He was old school and expected us to stay married till the end. It was at the funeral that I suddenly realized how alone I was in the world. It was just me, the chaplain, and a couple of their neighbors who attended. I couldn't even take mom, she didn't even know what was going on for a week or two. After I explained to mom that he was gone whenever she was lucid enough, but I can't bear to see her anguish every time she hears it. So now I just say he's out for a bit. Mary was sobbing by now, but I had no more tears to cry. I had been emotionally drained for a while. My gaze landed on the solitary birthday card on the mantel, and Mary seemed to notice. I continued in the same neutral tone, I may be alone, and mom doesn't even recognize me, but I owe her for bringing me into this world. So yes, I'm packing up everything to take care of her for whatever time she has left. It's astounding to see the ripple effects of your actions and how many people they've affected. You destroyed our marriage, ruined my relationship with my kids, and tore apart my family. I finished with the bitterness I had promised I wouldn't show, but I couldn't help myself. I refuse to take all the blame for this. At least Dan remains loyal to me. And let's not forget, you were the one who betrayed us with Sandy Thompson, Miranda retorted angrily. Her words didn't provoke the reaction she expected from me. Instead of getting upset, I burst into laughter, tears streaming down my face. Ah yes, Sandy Thompson, the reason you spent over 15 years plotting your revenge. You made it clear I couldn't even mention her name, threatening to leave me and take the kids if I did. While that ship has sailed, I'd never touched Sandy Thompson. I shouted back at her. When I woke up in her bed, I was still wearing the same tuxedo from the night before. Nothing ever happened. You expect me to believe that? Mary yelled back. Of course I do. I've never lied to you before, and I have no reason to start now, I replied, my voice calming as I regained my composure. Fine, she responded, her tone resembling Kelly more than the mature woman I was married to. Her reply bothered me for some unknown reason. I could tell she still doubted me, and for some inexplicable reason, it was crucial to me that she believed. I grabbed my phone, activating the loudspeaker, and dialed my former office, quickly reaching Jane, the receptionist. Hey Jane, it's Alan Dowd. Oh hi Alan, are you all set for the move? We'll miss you around here, Jane said sincerely. Yeah, all packed up. Just catching up with an old friend before hitting the road. Hey, I'm trying to get in. Touch with a former colleague from the Little Rock office. Not sure if she's still there. Can you check if there's a Sandy Thompson? Sure thing, Alan. Hold on a sec. After a brief pause, she returned, Yep, she's still here. Do you want her number, or should I connect you? Thanks, Jane. 
just put me through and take care of yourself. If Paul decides to pop the question, remember I expect an invitation will do, Alan. Don't forget about us here, you go transferring now, Jane chuckled before connecting the call. Mary's expression soured, but she was now fixated on me. Hello, Sandy speaking, Sandy answered. Hi Sandy, it's Alan Dowd from the Granville office. I'm not sure if you remember me. Remember you? Goodness, I've had dreams about you for years, the man I desired but never got, she replied, chuckling. How have you been? It's almost like telepathy because I've been thinking about you lately. It must have been 16 years since our last conversation, although I did spot you at the gala a few times. We never got a chance to catch up, though. Actually, it was 17 years ago, though I have to confess I don't recall much from that night, I said, chuckling back at her. Oh, you were such a riot that night. What do you remember then? Her voice carried a smile. Well, I recall stepping off the stage and the champagne at the table, but beyond that, things got a bit hazy. That was the first and last time I ever got drunk, I confessed. And my, were you drunk? I must confess I had my eye on you that night, although I'm certain I had competition from all the single ladies in attendance. A tall, dark, handsome man like yourself was attracting attention left and right. When I finally got you out on the dance floor and felt how strong you were, I couldn't help but swoon, although being called Mary All Might was a bit unsettling. It did make me realize how devoted you were to your wife. Mary's expression changed drastically, her complexion even paling. Slightly. But you only made it until around 11 before you passed out in your chair. By the time everything wrapped up around 12.30, everyone had retired to their rooms except for you. So, I enlisted the help of the night porters. The major issue was that no one knew your room number, and the hotel's computers were offline for updates. Those electronic keycards don't reveal much. The only solution was to bring you to my room, which was quite the feat considering your size. I must confess I was a bit mischievous, she admitted sheepishly. I accidentally brushed against you while we were moving you onto the bed. It was just a brief touch, but it confirmed to me that you're well endowed. You didn't even stir during the whole ordeal. In fact, you remained completely unconscious. Anyhow, fueled by alcohol and desire, I stripped naked and slept beside you, hoping to entice you. Obviously, it didn't work because when I woke up, you were gone, and no one saw you for the rest of the weekend. All I can say is your wife is one lucky woman. Mary sat with her head in her hands, grappling with the magnitude of her actions. I couldn't summon any sympathy, considering it was her own choices and assumptions that led to this situation. Her calculated efforts for revenge over the years revealed a side of her I hadn't truly known. She's my ex-wife now, and knowing what I know, I should have taken you up on that offer, I replied, chuckling. She laughed in response. Well, you're about seven years too late if you were hoping to reconnect. I'm happily married these days with two wonderful children. I still use the name Thompson professionally, but it's Sandy Roberts these days. I met Robert eight years ago and he was the first person since you who could penetrate my defenses. Mary's demeanor suddenly shifted, her face contorted with anguish. I was puzzled by her reaction as she continued, it's because of Rob that you came to mind, isn't that strange? She chuckled. His older brother Dan is getting married soon, and the wedding will be in your area, and his fiancée Andy shares your last name, Dowd. I wondered if she's related to you, as you're the only Dowd I've ever known. Suddenly, Mary's reaction made sense to me. I don't recall having any relatives named Andy. The only person I remember with that nickname was from high school, and she detested it so much that she'd throw fits, fearing people would mistake her for a boy, I'd mention, pointedly glancing at Miranda, who appeared visibly ashamed. It was as if I hardly knew her anymore, well, no one could mistake Andy for a boy. She's stunning. She also has wonderful children, Kelly and Luke, who are both in college now. Kelly and Rob's daughter, Cassie, is good friends with my daughter, and they share a room in Florida. I had them as bridesmaids at my wedding, and Luke was an usher for Rob. We've crossed paths with them a few times during Christmas and Thanksgiving over the years. Rob mentioned they've been seeing each other on and off for 13 years. That brief remark spoke volumes to me. It indicated that her parents were aware of the situation and had covered for her whenever she wasn't around. I'd call her, and they'd make excuses until Mary called back shortly after. Honestly, I don't think they should get married because it seems doomed from the start. Why would you say that after they've been together for so long? Well, they're both habitual cheaters. 
I mean, Dan was unfaithful to his first wife, Lisa, with Andy. It's baffling how he manages it because Lisa was also incredibly attractive. I've only seen pictures of her, but still. Anyway, I once confronted Andy about it, and she explained that her husband and kids accepted that she had a work husband and a home husband. She divided her time between the two, and apparently, her husband had a similar arrangement with someone from his workplace. I made it crystal clear to Rob that I'd take drastic measures if he ever dared to entertain such ideas, yet Dan continues to see someone else while being with Andy, and it's been ongoing. His current paramour is named Tilly, and he meets her when he's in Chicago. According to Rob, Dan travels there every couple of weeks for work. They wouldn't even be getting married if Dan's superiors hadn't pressured him to legitimize his relationship with Andy after her home husband sued their company following their divorce. Turns out, her ex-husband didn't share the same understanding of their arrangement. Rob mentioned that their company had to shell out a hefty sum, thank you very much, $600,000 to settle the matter, and gave Dan an ultimatum to fix things or face termination. Not exactly the most solid foundation for starting a life together, wouldn't you agree? Still, cheating and being coerced into marriage by his employer, it's quite the situation. Miri had rushed to the bathroom, retching audibly. It was understandable, her entire perception had been shattered. The honest and loyal Dan she knew turned out to be a fake, but that wasn't my concern anymore. I continued chatting with Sandy for a few more minutes. She shared stories about her children and what lay ahead for me. I had secured a new job in the insurance field with a reference from my current company, located near my mom's place. Instead of sales, I'd be working from home on the investigative side. The pay wouldn't match my current income, but it would suffice for my needs, plus it came with an office and an assistant. As I finished my conversation with Sandy, Miranda returned. We exchanged numbers and promised to stay in touch. She looked worse for wear, her face pale, and her makeup smudged or entirely gone. She seemed to have aged in just a short time. I'm truly sorry, Al, she said, and I believed her. As am I, Miranda. Look, I have to head to Brunswick by morning. It was a six-hour drive, but I knew I'd make a few stops along the way. Those boxes are yours, all the clothes, pictures, and belongings you left behind. I was going to have them sent over next week, but since you're here, I can help you load them into your car if you'd like. Um, could I ask you a huge favor? She couldn't bring herself to meet my gaze as she spoke. Could I crash here tonight? I just can't bear the thought of heading back right now. After a brief pause, I casually deposited my keys onto the table within her reach. Feel free to settle in. Just remember to hand the keys to the real estate agents. The deal closes next Monday, so you've got about nine days if you need them. Someone will swing by on Sunday to clear out the remaining items and spruce up the place. Utilities are covered until Monday. Look after yourself, Mary. I'm pressed for time. Glancing back as I exited, I caught sight of a despondent figure seated at the table. Thanks to everyone who tuned in for today's narratives. If you enjoyed, please consider liking and subscribing. Your feedback on the events is welcome in the comments. Farewell, and take care.